Autism Canada depends on the generous support of viewers like you. If you find this presentation helpful, consider donating at autismcanada.org. I would say two or three years ago I was in Chicago at a conference and I went to a seizure lecture because uh, my son never did have seizures but I was interested in it because I knew a lot of individuals with autism uh, would develop them or have them and I was so impressed by this presentation and lo and behold it was Dr. Adams that was giving him. We do not have a lecture on seizures in our library of videos so I'm really excited uh, to get this lecture done today and I know that those of you with family members with seizures will really benefit. So welcome Dr. Adams back to the podium. Thanks very much. Um, we have a lot to learn about seizures but um, I'll just address first a question a young woman asked me. Um, Gee, I have a grandchild with uh, seizure with autism but he doesn't have seizures. Is this lecture going to be relevant? So the first thing I'd like to point out is that Roughly about 30% of individuals with autism eventually develop a seizure. So they may have one during infancy, but it's also very common for them to develop them at adolescence or even later in life. And so that's part of the reason. Also, roughly 60% of children with autism who don't have obvious seizures have subclinical seizures, or what we'll call abnormal EEG activity, and that you won't know it unless you do a 24-hour EEG on your child. And so hopefully that sets the stage a little bit for why seizures are actually uh, relevant to many uh, families with autism as we begin to learn a lot more about them. But we do have a lot to learn about seizures. And I won't claim to be a seizure expert, but I've worked with a few people like Dr. Richard Fry. He's a, a pediatric neurologist who is an expert in both epilepsy and in seizures. And so he and I um, worked in a study together, and he really did most of the work. Um, but then I'm, after this presentation, then I'll also give a presentation with another colleague of mine from New York University who has looked at some innovative treatments for seizures. So I'm actually going to combine two talks with two colleagues of mine into one. I should mention, too, what really got me motivated to look at seizures, because my daughter does not have a seizure, but... Uh, very unfortunately, I, there was a young boy in our uh, Phoenix community who had uh, died from one of his seizures, and that really struck home. It made me very sad, um, and I've seen too many children that I know who have died from seizures. Seizures are the leading cause of death for uh, children and young adults with autism, so they, we need to take them uh, very seriously. It's not necessarily the seizure, but the seizure-related event, so a fall hitting your head that's a result of the seizure. So they, they can be, unfortunately, a very serious issue. And so, um, again, just to give you some basic background on this, and I'll try to go a little bit slower in this talk than the other one, roughly 25 to 38 percent of adults with autism uh, have seizures, and about 30 to 60 percent have what we call subclinical electrical discharges. So it's not enough to cause a fall down seizure, but it's enough to probably be disruptive of their memory, of their learning, of their attention. So this abnormal electrical activity, although it's not enough to cause them to fall down, is enough to disrupt their thinking and is affecting their, their cognitive ability. Surprisingly, we don't know the cause of most seizures. That in a few cases, it might be due to a brain malformation. In a few cases, it's due to a metabolic disorder that's been discovered. I think there's probably many more cases like that. In some cases, it may be due to inflammation. In a few cases, food reactions. But according to Dr. Fry, roughly 80% of the, his patients, they just don't know what is the cause of the seizure. And that makes it very difficult to come up with effective treatments. Um, so what I want to do is share with you the results of a paper we published, and it's available free online, where we did a national survey of uh, families of uh, children who have seizures uh, to get feedback from them. So we collected feedback from over 700 families um, to find out what treatments they thought were effective at reducing the seizure, but also because there's such great concern that use of seizure med and seizure control medications for years could have an adverse effect, we wanted to look at what are the potential side effects of using those seizure medications, because some uh, anti-seizure medications seem to have much worse side effect profile than others. And then also we wanted to look at a few novel 
um, treatments that are being used for treating seizures that seem very promising, and I'll talk more about those um, as we go along. So we have many unanswered questions about seizures, um, and so we, in our national survey, we collected data on the uh, characteristics of the people, their age, their gender, their medical conditions, the type of seizures they had, uh, whether or not it related to regression, the types of medications they used, uh, consideration of special diets, there's been a lot of interest in that in seizures, use of nutritional supplements, and alternative treatments. And so this is a web-based survey that was advertised through the help of ARI, and then a number of other groups also helped advertise it. Um, and what we did was for each treatment, so for each treatment we would ask them, what is the effect of the treatment on seizures? Does it help reduce it in your child's case, or did it worsen it? And what about its effect on many other symptoms? What's the effect of it on sleep, on language, on communication, on stereotypic behaviors, on hyperactivity, on attention and mood and other side effects? So we used a seven-point scale so we can then see um, what the distribution was. And again, we're going to talk about the average results. So a given medication might be better or worse for a particular person. We want to look on average for hundreds of families which medications are the most effective. So looking at the families who responded to our survey, it was about a four to one boy to girl ratio, um, which is very similar to that in general autism. And so that tells us that there's probably not much difference in the rate of seizures in uh, boys versus girls, it seems to be roughly similar. And some studies have suggested it might be more common in girls, but um, this is the largest study, and it suggests that there's really not much difference as a function of gender. And looking at those who were diagnosed, three quarters were diagnosed with autism, um, a quarter with PDD, and a, a very few with Asperger's, suggesting that probably seizures are less common in those with Asperger's or PDD and more common in those with autism. Again, it just suggests that there could be sampling bias. In terms of the types of seizures, there, about half of the children had what we call a grand mal seizure. That means during the seizure, the person actually loses, con loses consciousness and they begin falling, they fall down, and their arms and legs are moving spontaneously. So that's the most severe type of seizure. In about 40% of cases, it involved partial seizures. So that's where you have abnormal movements just on one side of the body or just on one portion of the body. So it might be just one arm or just the face that is having it, but you're also um, lacking consciousness. Um, there are absent seizures which are much harder to detect, and that's where someone is just unresponsive just unresponsive for several seconds or longer, could be a minute or more. So one time we were doing a blood draw on a uh, child with autism who had had a history of seizures in the past, hadn't had one in a year, but then um, right after that blood draw, I had an absent seizure, totally unresponsive um, to any, um, uh, any calling them their name, shaking them. And so that, hap that was also happened in about 40% of cases. There are a few children with uh, Landau-Kleffner syndrome, a particular type, um, a few with subclinical um, epileptiform discharges. We call that subclinical seizure, where they had had an EEG done, and from that EEG they had noticed that there was a seizure issue. Now, unfortunately, many uh, physicians will only do, if you suspect a seizure, they may only do a seizure for an hour or two. And that's useful if your child is having frequent seizures, then that may give you a clue to confirm that. But if that does not occur, if you don't have a seizure occur during those couple hours you're looking at, what, what Dr. Fry and I and many others recommend is a 23-hour seizure, a 23-hour EEG, which generally requires an overnight stay in a hospital. And the reason for that is seizures are actually more common during sleep time. And so you want to observe the child during sleep time, and you're just more likely to observe a seizure event uh, during those times. Um, in terms of uh, regression, about 28% of the families reported their childhood had regression. About 4% reported just a plateau in development. 43% were um, early onset autism. And about 24% um, eventually, through a variety of diagnoses, eventually had a diagnosis of autism or PDD or Asperger's, but they didn't have obvious symptoms early in life. It just evolved to that. And that's roughly similar 
to those in general with autism. For the subset of kids with autism who had regression, we asked them what the regression was associated with. 40% said that the, their autism began immediately after they had their seizure. So when they had the seizure, then at that point afterwards is when the uh, regression began. 28%, first there was a high fever, and then um, the regression began. 20% viral illness, a couple percent head trauma. Very surprisingly, 70% of the families who had a child with regression reported that the regression was associated with a vaccination that they had received. The child was developing normally up until that point, and then after the vaccination, they felt that that was the cause. And again, this is parents' opinion. It's not a rigorous study, but it's a pretty large survey study, so I think it's worth looking at. In terms of how to detect um, seizures, EEG is the most prevalent clinical test out there and accounted for about 75% of the tests. But 18% were just so severe, it's so obvious they're having a seizure, you don't need to do a clinical test. Um, about half of individuals with um, seizures will carry an emergency medication with them. Some, will, some kids with seizures will snap out of it. Some actually seem to need a medication or the seizure will go on for a very long time. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to the heart of what I wanted to discuss, which is how we analyze the data on a huge number of um, different seizure treatments. So we looked at of order uh, 40 different uh, seizure treatments that were used for autism, and Richard Fry, who's a great statistician, then looked at how these clustered together. So first I'm just gonna show you the data where we look at all of the antiepileptic medications versus all of the other, the, all the other alternative treatments which are, which are special diets, nutritional supplements, et cetera. And so what we see here, and maybe I need a pointer if we have one. Um, do we have a pointer up here? Ah, great. All right, so what we see here is first looking at seizures, so a four means no change, a seven means much uh, better, a one means much worse. So we found that just in general, taking anti-seizure medications generally improve seizures. That's a good thing. Um, but also, all the non-medication approaches had some effect, but on average, only about half as much for reducing seizures. But then averaging across all the anti-seizure meds, they tended to slightly worsen sleep, slightly worsen communication, slightly worsen behavior, really worsen attention, and also worsen mood. So that's not a good story, that all these medications, when used long term, seem to worsen all these symptoms. Again, these are averages. So there's a need to search for which medications are gonna be less harmful to a particular child. But the other treatments generally seem to be helpful for all of those other symptoms, so very different. So then what we did is we looked at just the anti-epileptic drugs to begin with, and we looked at uh, dividing them into different clusters. And we basically generally found that they fell into three cluster groups. So one cluster, and I'll explain what each cluster is in a moment, but this cluster group seemed very promising because it had the most effect on uh, reducing seizures, similar to cluster three, but also it had the least adverse effect on all of the other symptoms. So whereas Cluster three had a good effect on reducing seizures. It also had a lot more adverse effects associated with it. So I, I won't go into gory detail on these other two, but now I'm gonna focus on just this one cluster of treatments that all together seem to have the most promising profile. And so these are the four medications in that first cluster that had the most promising profile, whereas there's phenobarbital that had the, um, uh, the worst side effect profile. And so looking at these uh, four most promising medications, so the first one here is valproic acid, and that one had a good effect on reducing seizures and not too much adverse effect on the other symptoms. And not surprisingly, that was used by 246 of the over 700 families in our study. So it's very popular. If we look at the other medications, um, again, similar profile, um, except that um, ethosuximide had 
um, slightly lower effect on seizures, and also perhaps a little bit worse side effect profile, especially for sleep. Again, these are averages. And maybe just to give you a sense, too, that really, in many cases, uh, picking the right anti-seizure medication is a trial and error process. Roughly a third of the time, a single medication will help control seizures. Roughly a third of the time, two or more uh, anti-seizure meds can help control seizures. But in roughly a third of the time, uh, the seizures are resistant to medications, and that's when you have to look at some of the um, alternative uh, treatments. So bottom line is that of all these uh, medications, valproic acid seemed like uh, one of the most promising, and again, no surprise, that's why it's used so much. Now let's look at the non-drug um, anti-seizure treatments. And so these, again, fell into three different subclusters, and it's the first subcluster I'm going to concentrate on because that had good effect on seizures, but also had good effect on all of the other symptoms. So very, very compelling. Um, and so this is just um, telling you what these other treatments are. Um, I will mention briefly the uh, subcluster three, the use of steroids. Brief, short term, they can be beneficial, but so harmful long term. And a vagal nerve stim stimulator is a pretty invasive device being implanted into the person. And the, the research on that is not very promising. But we looked at a lot of different medications, a lot of different supplements. But these four treatments were the ones that seemed overall to be the most promising. Um, and so let's look at these four in particular. So these four are the ketogenic diet, the gluten-free, casein-free diet, the Atkins diet, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So let me first explain what each of these are. The ketogenic diet has been used for many decades for um, treating seizures. Um, it's uh, uh, for whenever you have a seizure that's resistant to medications, the ketogenic diet is then usually the recommended approach. It's a very difficult diet to implement because it's rough, means you're eating 90% of your uh, calories come from fat, 10% from protein, and essentially zero from carbohydrates. So a typical meal might be a stick of butter, a cup of sour cream, and a, some fatty bacon. And that's your meal. It usually needs to be implemented in a hospital setting because it's so difficult to get the kids to eat this as the meal. And it is also um, very difficult. It can have a lot of stomach uh, issues and nausea issues. But it seems to be very effective in reducing seizures. And if those seizures are life-threatening, then it seems to be necessary. Um, but an alternative diet that's been proposed and used quite a bit is called the Atkins diet. And I'll talk more about that, but it's a modified version of the Atkins diet that's used for weight loss. But like the ketogenic diet, it's a low-carbohydrate diet. But in addition to being low-carbohydrate, it contains a high amount of fat and also a substantial amount of protein, typically about 30% protein, 60% uh, uh, fat, and about 10% uh, or less, uh, usually less than 10% carbohydrates. The gluten-free, casein-free diet is interesting because it has some similarities. You're avoiding gluten, which is a carbohydrate. You're avoiding casein, which is in milk. And milk has a lot of milk sugar in it, meaning a lot of carbohydrates. And so it has elements of both the ketogenic diet and the Atkins diet, and it has some similarity. And HBOT, as I mentioned in my talk earlier this morning, completely different approach, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So let's look at these four. So the ketogenic diet, the best for reducing seizures of these uh, treatments, and as good as any of the anti-seizure medications, um, according to these ratings. Uh, but also, rather than worsening symptoms, it tends to improve sleep, improve communication, improve behavior, improve attention, and improve mood. That's pretty impressive. Um, if we look at the other diet, the um, Atkins diet, again, good at reducing um, good at, uh, effect on seizures, uh, not much effect on sleep, but some improvement in communication and in uh, behavior, attention, and mood. Um, the GFCF diet, not quite as effective for seizures, but so perhaps some benefit there. And then also good benefit on all of the other symptoms. And finally, HBOT, perhaps the least effect on seizures, but perhaps some um, on average, and yet some benefits in other areas. Now again, this is all open label, so we need to take it with a grain of salt for um, placebo effect. 
But still, comparing these treatments compared to the medication treatments, I think these make a very compelling argument. In fact, it's so compelling that a number of researchers have proposed that rather than trying the medications first when your child has a seizure and then doing the diets only if your child is not able to handle the medications, this data, I would argue, suggests that maybe you should consider trying the diets first uh, rather than waiting. Uh, because overall, the long-term effect on symptoms seems very promising, whereas it seems for many children being on these anti-seizure medications for years seems to somewhat stunt their intellectual growth. Again, most studies are done for seizures for very short term, three months, six months. That's not very helpful data if your child's going to be on the medication for 10 years. We just don't have data like that. Now, I'll mention that whereas there have been dozens of studies for the ketogenic diet, very widely used, there have actually now been 19 studies for the Atkins diet, um, uh, and they generally show almost the same benefit as for the ketogenic diet, but just much easier to handle uh, because it's just a much um, easier diet. If we look at those um, other types of um, treatments, um, cluster one and cluster two, uh, this is for subclinical seizures. So again, about 30 to 60 percent of children with autism who don't have abnormal, who don't have obvious seizures, are still having this very abnormal electrical activity in their brain, and that is probably affecting their learning, their ability to pay attention, their cognition. And so, even if you aren't ha don't have obvious uh, seizures, people have tried a variety of treatments for these subclinical seizures. So we looked at the families who had reported having these subclinical seizures that had been detected on EEG. And again, we could see which category of medications were most important for those. So like for, with regular seizures, both um, uh, the medications and the non-medication approaches were effective at reducing these um, subclinical seizures, uh, but the non-medication approaches tended to improve symptoms, whereas the medications tended to worsen uh, symptoms. So to summarize uh, this part of my talk, um, seizures occur in about 25 to 35 percent of adults with autism. So some people develop seizures in infancy, some in early childhood, quite a bit during adolescence. Puberty seems to cause that, and then also some even into adulthood. But these subclinical seizures also occur and probably affect language and behavior. Traditional medications do work in reducing seizures, but they seem to cause quite a variety of side effects, some more so than others. And our data suggest which are the four medications that are going to be least likely, on average, to cause side effects. But there's also some limited evidence that other treatments, such as the ketogenic diet, the Atkins diet, uh, the GFCF diet, both reduce seizures and improve symptoms. And at least the ketogenic diet seems to work as well as the best of the anti-seizure medications. Um, the, for the subclinical seizures, again, both effects seem to work. Um, so our data suggests which treatments are more likely to be beneficial, which are more likely to have side effects. But again, each person is individual. So I think the bottom line is if your child does develop seizures, you want to look at um, considering different medications. Hopefully this study gives you some guide as to which are the ones more likely on average to be beneficial than others, um, but also to really encourage you to look for side effects that can occur. And there, for some sp each medication, it may have its own additional specific side effect profile. We don't have all the time to go into that. But I want to talk a little bit more about this particular approach, the modified Atkins diet, because I feel that's the most promising. The ketogenic diet is perhaps slightly more effective, although it's unclear, but perhaps slightly more effective, but it's so hard to continue feeding your child these very high-fat diet. So there have now been a total of 18 studies involving a total of 215 children and 50 adults, which suggests that the modified Atkins diet is about as effective as the ketogenic diet. 46% of the people using it have more than a 50% reduction in seizure frequency, and about a third of them have a 90% uh, reduction of seizures. So it can be very, very effective, much better tolerated long-term because you're eating more protein. It's just a much easier diet to follow. There have not been any previous studies of it for seizures and autism, uh, but there have been a number of physicians who have reported using it with good benefit, 
Uh, ARI just funded a study that Richard Fry and I will be doing on this uh, modified Atkins diet for children with autism and seizures, and so we're going to be starting that study in a few months, and we have high hopes for it. Um, but what we're going to do is rather than doing just the modified Atkins diet, we're also going to implement it in a gluten-free, casein-free form because the gluten-free, casein-free diet helps, the modified Atkins diet helps. We're going to put both together and see if that works even more effectively than either one separately. Um, now that makes for a pretty restricted diet because usually when you do modified Atkins diet, you're still eating a high amount of cream as your main source of fat. And so we're going to be removing cream and replacing that with healthy fats, uh, vegetable oil fats that are very healthy for you. Um, so what we've proposed and what we're going to be studying very soon is this gluten-free, casein-free modified Atkins diet, uh, which some physicians have been using with good benefit. It involves basically less than 10 grams of carbs. So it's like eating a few potato chips. That's your total carb for the day. Um, it's 60% or more fat, 30% protein. Um, but the emphasis is on high quality fats. So whereas the other diets don't emphasize necessarily high quality fats, this is a high quality fat diet. Typically 300 to 500 fat calories a day of a blend of essential fatty acids. Um, with a 4 to 1 ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. And so it includes a combination of safflower oil, flax oil, coconut oil, olive oil, and fish oil. And then high-quality protein, eggs, meats, chicken, turkey, fish. Um, and no hormones, no antibiotics, free-range and organic if possible. Making sure you're taking an adequate intake of non-starchy vegetables, which basically means leafy greens, uh, celery, that sort of thing. Potatoes are very starchy. You wouldn't be able to have those. So maybe one French fry. That would be about it. Um, it's a tough diet, all right? But seizures are life-threatening. Um, it's adequate but not excessive calorie intake. It seems that people on the modified Atkins diet, if they're overweight, they uh, lose weight to a healthier weight. But those who are at an average weight don't lose weight. So it seems to just help you approach a healthier weight. As I mentioned, the diet will be gluten-free, uh, dairy-free, and soy-free. It involves minimal consumption of junk foods, replacement with healthy snacks, things like nuts, avocado, etc. Total avoidance of artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives. As young, one young woman I know who had seizures throughout her life until in her mid-20s, she went on a diet that avoided all artificial colors, and she became seizure-free just from that change. And then one day she had a green drink that had some artificial green coloring in it. She had a seizure and then has been seizure-free for years since then. Um, also avoiding uh, sugar, because obviously that's a carbohydrate, so using stevia for, uh, as a sweetener. And then reduced consumptions of pesticides by going organic. So this is what we propose to do. We haven't done it yet, so in a year from now, hopefully we'll have data, and we hope it will help a lot of the kids with severe um, seizure problems. And so this gives you some more information if you want to learn about um, uh, that particular diet. Now what I'm going to do is change to a second presentation on seizures. Um, give me just a moment to change to that. And so I wanted to share with you some um, data that hasn't been published yet, but I just find it very compelling. It was done by a colleague of mine at New York University. Unfortunately, he's a man in his um, late 70s, and so it's not clear he'll get around to writing up these results. But the results were really quite striking. So <clears throat> um, basically, in looking at seizures, we don't know what is the cause of the seizure. You can have partial and generalized seizures. You can have simple and complex seizures. But the main issue is that we have a suspicion as to what might actually be one of the leading causes of seizures. Again, 80%, it's, it's roughly estimated 80% of seizures we don't know the cause of. But in kids with autism, I think we have a very good guess, and I want to share that guess with you. Again, this is unpublished data, but I think it's very consistent with some data that is out there. So within the brain, which is the area that's generally having the seizures, there's an enzyme called GAD. And that's an enzyme that converts glutamate, which is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. That's the one that causes your neurons to fire, to 
generate an electrical signal. So GAD is the enzyme that converts glutamate, which is the primary um, excitatory neurotransmitter, to GABA, which is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. It tells the neurons not to fire. And we think what the problem is in autism is that the kids with autism have too much glutamate, so their neurons fire too much and not enough GABA to cause them to stop firing. Okay, so that was what we suspected was a problem. Um, I published a paper showing that kids with autism in their blood um, had somewhat elevated levels of um, uh, uh, glutamate and somewhat lower levels of uh, GABA. And so what we did was we want, in the study, my friend Tapan Aja looked at uh, brain samples, so from autopsy samples, and he looked at the amount of GAD present in the brains of autopsy samples of people with autism. And these were two, there are two types of GAD, GAD 65 and 67. Um, GAD 65 um, requires, in order for this enzyme to work, most enzymes require a cofactor. And so uh, it turns out that for the GAD enzyme, it requires P5P, which is the active form of vitamin B6. So if you don't have enough vitamin B6, this enzyme won't work. But it seems that the issue with GAD65, it takes about 12 times the amount of uh, vitamin B6 as does the GAD67. So it's more sensitive and needs more vitamin B6. GAD65 is primarily active inside the neuronal cell. GAD67 is primarily active outside the neuronal cell. So both are important. Um, and both are important for reducing glutamate and converting it into GABA. And so in the brain samples, they looked at 14 uh, individuals with autism and seven controls. And for a brain study, that's a pretty big study. All of these were autistic children who had had partial or complex partial seizures. So strictly those children who had autism and seizures, and they looked at seven different parts of the brain. And what they found is that across these seven different parts of the brain, there are several parts of the brain. So this is normal. And so in this part of the brain, in the prefrontal lobe, which is very important for executive functioning, kids with autism had about half the amount of this enzyme compared to the typical children. And also in the parietal lobe, kids with autism about, had about half the amount of this enzyme compared to other children. So not all parts of the brain are affected, but two of the seven parts of the brain had much lower levels of GAD. So lower amounts of this enzyme means that the brain, within the brain, glutamate will not be converted very well to GABA, and that means you're much more likely to have seizures if you have too much glutamate and not enough GABA. So just lacking these enzymes seems to be a major clue for these individuals as to what was contributing to their seizures. Then if we look at the other enzyme, GAD67, it's even worse. That if we look in the prefrontal lobe, there's only very small amounts of GAD67, a little bit less in the frontal lobe, a lot less in the temporal lobe, a lot less over here in the cerebellum, a lot less here in the substantia nigra. And again, these are just seven parts of the brain. It's a pilot study uh, just to begin looking at it. So it's very, very, very suspicious data that there's so much difference. So lower levels of GAD would mean it's very likely that those individuals had increased amount of glutamate, which is excitatory, and not enough GABA. So once a seizure starts, it's going to go on. So in the cerebellum, what, that's the part of the brain that affects the motor control, the language, and the attention. The prefrontal lobe is what affects the executive function, the planning, the processing of sensory input. So can you understand the sensory input? The parietal lobe is what integrates the sensory information, includes, including your visual and spatial. Temporal lobe affects your auditory perception, your long-term memory. Substantial nigra is what affects the eye movement, motor planning, reward seeking, addiction, and it, we believe it's especially important for seizures. So just to summarize, uh, looking in these um, brain samples, um, there were lower levels of GAD65 in two of seven areas, and lower levels of GAD67 in four of seven areas, suggesting that they have a decreased ability to convert glutamate to GABA. But the way enzymes work is if you have less of the enzyme, 
One treatment for that is simply to give more of the cofactor, because if you give more of the cofactor, then the enzyme can work harder. So although you have less of the cofactor, by giving more of the vitamin B6, you can help that enzyme work more constantly, work more efficiently, and help overcome that problem. So vitamin B6 is the cofactor, and so then this data would suggest that increasing the amount of B6 should increase the function of GAD and counter the effect of low levels. In fact, there is a type of seizure disorder called a B6 dependent seizure disorder. It's pretty rare, only about 100 or so recorded cases uh, in the world. But the treatment, the test for it is just you give them vitamin B6 and see if it stops the seizures. And if it does, that's vitamin B6 dependent seizures. Um, and so uh, Dr. Adja then went on to look at the nutritional status of children with autism who had severe seizures. So I want to emphasize these are kids with very severe seizures. They were uh, children 4 to 16 years old. They came to NYU hospital because they were having very severe seizures. Their se seizures were averaging four minutes. They were having three to 14 seizures a day. And so it's very, very severe, uh, life-threatening seizures. These children were at risk of dying and needed treatment. Um, the epileptic seizures were uh, confirmed by EEG on most of the children. And some of the children, the, uh, the families consented to doing a spinal tap to draw out some of their CSF, some of their cerebral spinal fluid, so that we could try to figure out what's going on inside the brain. So in all of the kids, they drew blood, but in some of the kids, they also drew um, cerebral spinal fluid. And what they found in general, I don't necessarily have time to go over all of it, the bottom line is that some of them were low in vitamin B1, some of them were low in biotin, some of them were low in vitamin E. Some of them were low, oh, sorry, I'll keep going. It's a little hard angle here. But um, some of them were low in uh, vitamin B6 um, and also low in the active form of vi vitamin B6 called P5P. So even though some of them were high in B6, the B6 is not active. The active form is the P5P. So it seems the inactive form was not being converted to the active form. All right, so that's very important. Looking at folic acid, that was low in children who were taking anticonvulsant medications, and um, some of them also had um, problems with the folic acid being transported into the brain. There's a deficiency called cerebral folate transport deficiency, cerebral folate deficiency, where the folic acid in the body cannot easily be transported into the brain. So you may have plenty of folic acid in the rest of your body but you need a special transport to transport it across the blood-brain barrier to the brain. And in fact, um, 11 of the children had that problem. And um, for those who were able to measure it in the CSF, uh, quite a few of them were low in uh, folic acid as well. Many of them were low in vitamin D. Some of them were, uh, about half of them were low in magnesium. Some were low in manganese. Some were low in selenium, um, both in the plasma and in the CSF. And oddly, some of them were low, were high in calcium. So calcium tends to be excitatory, whereas magnesium tends to be inhibitory. These are two very important electrolytes in your blood, and they have uh, counterbalancing effects. All right? So this tells us that overall, that there's a double problem, we think, going on in kids with autism. Now, these are two separate studies. So in the brain study, we found the kids with autism had less of GAD, the enzyme that converts glutamate to GABA. In this study, we found that they had less of the active form of vitamin B6. So that's suggesting that these kids with autism have a double problem. They have low levels of the enzyme and low levels of the cofactor needed to make the enzyme work. So that's a double problem that is going to probably explain, I think in many cases, the um, seizures that they had. Um, I'm going to just jump to one part here. Um, so in particular, if you looked at glutamate, um, glutamate was high in 14 of the 17 kids in the CSF, and it was even high in the plasma as well, outside of the brain. Um, whereas GABA was low in the CSF. Oddly enough, it was high in the plasma um, in a few kids and low in the plasma. Now, the plasma is a lousy way to measure GABA. Um, it's not, uh, ver 
I can go into more detail, but you want to look actually in the platelets rather than the plasma. Well, that was what they had to test. Um, so now I want to really focus on this slide, and I know I have a lot of data here, but a normal child would have this amount of um, glu uh, glutamate or glutamic acid, 0.65, in their CSF. A child with autism with these severe seizures had 30 times. When I saw this data at first, I said, that can't possibly be right. Uh, to Pan, there must be a typo here. They couldn't possibly have 30 times the level of glutamate in their CSF compared to typical, typical kids. He said, no, that's not a typo. That's what he found. Unbelievably high levels of glutamate. And that's exactly, I didn't believe it even then when he told me, until I looked up a paper on B6 dependent seizures. And in kids who have vitamin B6 dependent seizures, when they don't give them vitamin B6, they can have 100 times the normal amount of glutamate in their CSF. When you give them massive amounts of vitamin B6, several hundred times the RDA, it brings the level down to maybe 10 times normal and stops the seizures. Um, so this number actually seems very plausible now that I've learned more. Notice the plasma levels, not much difference. But in the CSF, very, very different. GABA, the normal kids, 130. The kids with seizures, less. So it's somewhat a problem of lower GABA, but it's primarily a problem of huge amounts of glutamate. Also, this vitamin B6, somewhat higher, about somewhat higher amounts of uh, the active form PLP compared to that in the typical uh, children. And also in the blood as well, we see about twice the level in the um, kids with um, in the typical kids versus the kids with autism. So this is a double problem. They don't have enough GAD, they don't have enough vitamin B6, and hence they have these massive amounts of glutamate that's going to make it very easy for the neurons to become excited, very easy to cause seizures. Um, so I don't want to get too technical here, but again, just a slide showing glutamine is converted to glutamate, and then glutamate can be converted to GABA, or it can be converted to alpha ketoglutarate, both reactions require vitamin, the active form of vitamin B6. Um, so I think I'm going to skip over this issue and move ahead. Um, so basically, neurons, um, neurotransmitters have two basic functions. They inform the receiving neuron to fire, so they can be excitatory, or they can tell the neuron to stop firing, so they're inhibitory. And so you need the right balance of the two. And this data, these two studies suggest that kids with autism are wildly imbalanced. I'm going to skip over a little bit that's a little too technical and then tell you about a treatment study that he did. Now, again, this is unpublished work, but I find it so compelling um, that I want to share it. Um, again, we need formal research studies to look at this more. Um, because they were just treating these children because these children were just so desperately ill. Um, and so the study started with 65 participants who had these very high rates of seizures, and they put them on the full ketogenic diet, so 85% fat, low protein, low carbs. It was a very difficult diet to do, and about five of the 65 families managed to do it. Okay, very difficult diet to implement. Now, with a nurse in a regular study, you may get up to more like 50%. Um, but they weren't very successful for these kids. So then they went to a mild version of the diet, which was high fat, but also high protein, and a little bit of carbs. They went with a four to one protein to carb ratio. Um, so just cutting down a lot on the carbs. And then th what they also did, in addition, was they gave them a special combination of supplements. It had a number of nutrients in it, taurine, folic acid at normal amounts. But the major thing I'll highlight here is it had massive amounts of vitamin B6. So this is uh, over, um, it's a, this is of order 500 times the RDA of vitamin B6. It had a, a bit of a number of other uh, nutrients in it. And by doing this, they found that 43 of the participants finished round one. On average, their seizure frequency decreased about 40%. So that was pretty good. But still, you're going from, say, 10 seizures a day to five, um, there's still five too many. So then they went for two weeks with no supplementation, and then they started another uh, sup com supplement combination, 
um, where they then treated them for an additional 60 days. And in this uh, combination, what they did, it's similar to the first, except in addition, they also added in a large amount of carnitine. And carnitine, I mentioned, is very important for transporting fats into the um, uh, mitochondria to help with energy production. And there are a few other changes too, but um, adding in a little bit of lipoic acid as well. When they added, when they switched to this supplement combination, they started with that same 43 participants who had finished round two, but now instead of reducing seizures by 40%, the seizure frequency went down to 75% reduction. So very impressive. And also the duration of the seizures went from about four minutes down to about two minutes. So again, uh, less severe seizures. Some of the kids improved dramatically and became essentially seizure free and are now in uh, regular school. Um, nine of the children had their CSF levels remeasured and the glutamate decreased 45% roughly. So instead of being 30 times normal, it's 15 times normal. Well, that's good, but it's still 15 times normal. So what does that tell us? Tells us probably we need to go to a much higher level of vitamin B6. Um, and so that's where the study ended. Um, and so it's very interesting. It gives a lot of clues for fu future formal research studies to suggest that First of all, this may be a major problem. And, and other researchers have suggested it too. Um, this is some hard data um, on that. Again, not published yet, but some very compelling data that um, uh, as suspected glutamate, the primary excitatory neurotransmitter is elevated in many kids with autism. And if you bring it down, then that will reduce seizures. But remember what I said about kids with vitamin B6 dependent seizures, that you could bring it down from 100 down to 10 times normal, and that was just enough to stop the seizures, but it was still 10 times normal. So what I'm trying to say, and maybe I'm not saying it very clearly, is that I think this is the tip of the iceberg, telling us these are for the kids with very severe seizure disorders. They may have 30 times the amount of glutamate that they need. Kids with milder seizure disorders may have only 10 times the amount of glutamate. Kids with subclinical seizures may have five times the amount of glutamate. I'm just guessing at these numbers, but the point I'm trying to make is that because we know about half of children with autism who don't have obvious seizures are having subclinical seizures, my guess is that the reason they're having these subclinical seizures is because this glutamate to GABA imbalance, and hence I think that's why uh, a big part of the reason why vitamin B6 is helpful in high dosages uh, for children. Uh, so many studies over decades looking at vitamin B6, but we haven't necessarily understood what the mechanism is, and I'm suggesting this might be one of those mechanisms. Um, so to conclude, for uh, children with autism and severe seizures, uh, or in seizures, in the CSF, glutamate was extremely high, GABA was low, um, and it was due to a double problem. And the double problem was a high amount of, uh, excuse me, a low amount of the enzyme and a low amount of the vitamin B6 needed to activate the enzyme. So it was this double problem that was causing these uh, seizures. And that the combination of this nutritional supplement, uh, or treating with this nutritional supplement combination seemed to really uh, reduce seizure frequencies, not totally, but quite a bit. And my suspicion is that if they went to a much higher level of B6, um, then it may reduce it even more. And so that's our hypothesis. Um, and then last thing, how am I doing on time? Okay. So the last thing I'll mention is um, Dan Rosenthal and others, Richard Fry, have been looking quite a bit at the issue of cerebral folate deficiency. And so this occurs when folate is not transported into the brain. And this data... Um, suggests that perhaps half of the children with severe seizures also have a cerebral folate deficiency. Um, part of the reason why the cerebral folate deficiency occurs is that the body's immune system seems to attack the transporter that transports folic acid into the brain. And it appears the reason the body's immune system makes that mistake is the body's immune system thinks that that um, transporter, that folate transporter, actually is structurally very similar to that of um, casein, the protein that's in milk. 
And so when children who have cerebral folate deficiency are put on a milk-free diet, when they're put on a milk-free diet, then eventually their antibodies to uh, milk go down, their antibodies then to their cerebral folate transporter go down, and more folic acid gets into their brain. So it's yet another reason to consider a um, dairy-free diet for individuals with autism. So there's preliminary data from uh, Richard Fry and Dan Rosignol they, that suggest that maybe half of children with autism have antibodies to cerebral folate receptor, but we don't know what fraction of typical kids have it. Some data suggest it's 10%. However, data we've done in our lab suggest that maybe a much higher percentage of typical kids also have these antibodies. Um, but what we've, uh, the bottom line is that just avoiding cow's milk, because that um, seems to uh, be affecting the body's immune response to the folate transporter, and then giving very high doses of folic acid. So it was in the other studies I mentioned where Jill James had looked at um, less than one milligram of folic acid this is suggesting one milligram per kilogram body weight. So for a, 30, uh, for a 60 pound child, you might be giving them 30 milligrams. It's a massive dose, very high dose, and it seems to help. The wonderful things about vitamins is they often are very safe. For most B vitamins, if you take high amounts of them, then the excess amount, you just pee out in your urine generally very safely. So this, um, when you're giving that high amount of folic acid, then you're generally giving it not as a nutritional supplement because then you'd have to take a huge number of pills. Instead, you're, uh, you are changing to a prescription medication. It's the same vitamin. It's just when you're giving it that dosage, then it's generally uh, prescribed as a um, prescription medication. It seems to help about half of the children with autism with cerebral folate deficiency, sometimes dramatically. The treatment seems very safe. Uh, but again, with any prescription medication, a physician should oversee it. I think you'll see a lot more research on this in the uh, coming years. It's a very intriguing um, uh, type of treatment to consider, this very, very high dose of folic acid. And again, it comes back to what I had mentioned um, at the very start of my presentation this morning. Folic acid seems to be really important for uh, kids with autism. So with that, I'm going to stop and uh, thank you very much and uh, turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you.